selection of Old Testament prophecies. We have three here uh, that we will. And in this one, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land upon which you lie, I will give to you and to your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is the place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. We see the virgin as a ladder, in this case a divine descent, that is that Christ wished to take on our complete human nature and heal that human nature. And some people say that why didn't God just speak a word and accomplish all this? What would have actually happened if at some given time in history God spoke simply a word provided our redemption, but forced us to become robots and to fulfill every detail of his will, have no, neither choice nor freedom of any kind. In the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, uh, we, Dostoevsky has the Grand Inquisitor putting Christ on trial when he returns, and the Grand Inquisitor said, among other things, you should have given them more miracles. Because, of course, miracles would compel people to believe. But you didn't. You gave them freedom. So Christ is accused for having given people freedom. But again, we, we go back 
to what we'd said before. Love demanded without freedom is a psychosis, it's not love. Love given without freedom is an obsession, but it isn't love. Love itself has to be freely given and freely received from both sides. The love of God is always present. Oh, give thanks unto the, to the God of gods, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, God has shown us something visible before us. He's given us the whole drama of the working out of our salvation. The incarnation being born as an infant, sanctifying the human birth into this world, sanctifying birth itself and re-sanctifying our infancy. Each, and then after a bit, he vanishes from, from the gospel itself until he reaches the age at which he is it's lawful for him to testify before the law. Now this is an age at which in ancient times some young men would have been getting married and probably ended up in, in the military force. In any case, they were young enough to fight. They were old enough to fight. Of course, people would, would have to get married quite young, but times when places when life expectancy was ultimately around 30, 35 years old. So you had to get your children to the age of bar mitzvah. It wasn't bar mitzvah until the 1700s, but anyway, till, uh, to get your children to that age where they could look, somehow look after themselves before you died. We're necessarily going to live that long. Women, of course, still outlived men when they didn't die in childbirth uh, or when they were beaten to death by their husbands. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, Christ re sanctifies in our middle years, re sanctifying all of human life. He begins his ministry at that age when he's old enough to sit at the gates with the elders and teach. So every aspect of, of, of life was before our eyes be sanctified in Jesus Christ. And of course, the human nature reunited with the divine nature in Christ. And finally, the power of death was defeated. And uh, Christ rose from the dead and took a completely human, perfect human nature into the heavenly kingdom with him as his ascension. The latter goes back into heaven. But our Lord Jesus Christ came first down that ladder, and that ladder was the Holy Virgin, the one chosen out of all ages and all generations to be the mother of God in the saving incarnation. So we liken her to this ladder of divine descent first and ascent. The angels descended and ascended on, on the ladder. Our Lord Jesus Christ descended by the ladder of the Most Holy Theotokos. The reading is from the prophecy of Ezekiel 43, 27 through 44, 4. I'll read part of it, not the whole thing. And that shall be that upon the eighth day, and so forward, the priest shall make your burnt offerings upon the altar, and your peace offering, and I will accept you, says the Lord. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looks toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord to me, This gate shall be shut, and it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince. He shall sit in it and eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. Then he brought me to the way of the north gate, before the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. There's two aspects to this reading. The first, those of you who are Orthodox know that we speak a great deal about the eighth day. Upon the eighth day, the priest shall offer burnt offerings upon this altar. We read that God created in seven aeons, uh, six aeons of time. And on the seventh day on, he kept the Sabbath. We understand that our Lord Jesus Christ would keep the Sabbath in the tomb. So, 
six days of creation, one day of preparation, and with the resurrection, the rising of the new sun, the sun of righteousness, we enter into the eighth day. Six days of creation, one day of preparation, the day of rest, and the eighth day, which is the day of redemption. And Apostle Paul mentions it when he says, he delineateth, he delineateth yet another day. He delineates yet another day, meaning the eighth day. And this is the day in which the gospel is preached to the whole world. We have no idea how long this day will last, but when the Son of Righteousness dawned forth from the tomb, the eighth day certainly began. And this is the day upon we, in which we live, and the day of our redemption. And our salvation is worked out during this eighth day which has now lasted for 2,000 years. The other thing is about the east gate, which is closed because the king, the Lord of glory, the God of Israel, has entered by it. This we also liken to the most holy virgin, that the gate of her womb was closed because the God of glory, the king, the creator of the heavens and the earth, dwelt in that womb and entered into this world through that womb. And therefore, no other child could dwell in that holy place in which the Lord, the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth had dwelt. And the glory of the Lord had certainly filled the womb of the virgin. This is something so often missed by some of our brethren uh, in, in the Protestant world in particular, who really don't stop to think seriously about these things. We confess that our Lord Jesus Christ is God that he's one of the Trinity, that he's the express image of the Father. He is truly God, truly divine. He came down from earth, was incarnate to the Virgin. The Holy Spirit overshadowed her womb and sanctified it. And the God of glory took form within it and took his flesh from her flesh, his blood from her blood. How could you just write her out of history then? Cast her off aside as somebody who was used and then forgotten. That she was the throne room, the holy of holies, the temple and the ark of the Most High God, who dwelt within her womb. Although the whole universe cannot circumscribe him, he humbled himself to be circumscribed in the womb of the Virgin. How could any sane person imagine that after that another child could dwell in that same womb and pass through that same entry into the world? No, the gate is closed because the King of Glory has entered through that gate. The reading from the book of Proverbs 9, 1 through 11. Again, I won't read the complete reading, just a part. Wisdom has built her house and has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her, her sacrifice. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whosoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live, and go in the way of understanding. He who reproves a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes a wicked man gets himself a blemish. Do not reprove a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and the years of your life will be added to you. And here again, the like in the Virgin to the wisdom in this in this reading. That come and learn. Hear wisdom. Hear the love of God. And when we say the fear of the Lord, what are we talking about? God is not a heavenly terrorist who's out to get you. God is not sitting up 
on the edge of the universe in some kind of rocking chair with a telescope, seeking to find things by which he may condemn you and do something horrible to you. Such a God could not be loved. Such a God could not love. Such a God would be a psychopath. No, the fear of God is that fear and trembling with which Moses saw him on the Mount of Sinai and which Moses saw his radiance on the mercy seat. But who would not be in fear and trembling of such a thing? Not fear of terror, but fear of being awe-stricken, dumbfounded, at wondering if you would survive having seen such a light, wondering if you would survive having seen the cloud in which God passed over you. In our Lord Jesus Christ, God, the Word who appeared on Mount Sinai, ego imio on, I am that I am. Uh, even the burning bush struck fear into Moses, although he didn't fear that the burning bush was going to hurt him or harm him. He was just awe-stricken, dumbfounded, and in, in a kind of, of, of terror, what kind of wondrous thing is this? Why am I allowed to behold this? Will I survive beholding this holiness? This is the kind of fear we're talking about. Too many people try to transfer this into a kind of terror and render God compoundly evil by suggesting that God is always sitting there looking for some reason to do something horrible to us, looking for some excuse to throw us into a torture chamber worse than anything the human mind could conceive for all eternity because we violated some fetish of his. That is not wisdom, that's foolishness. Wisdom teaches us something completely different and gives us understanding of something completely different. In the Letia, uh, the supplicatory portion of the Vesper service, O you people, today has come to pass the first fruits of our salvation. For lo, she who is foreordained from all generations as a mother and virgin and receiver of God, comes forth in birth from a barren woman. A flower has blossomed from Jesse, and from the root and branch has sprung. Let Adam, our forefather, be glad, and let Eve rejoice with great joy. For behold, she who was made plainly declares her daughter and descendant blessed. For, says she, unto me is born deliverance, through which I shall be set free from the bonds of Hades. Let David rejoice, striking upon the harp, and let him bless God. For lo, the virgin comes forth from a barren rock for the salvation of us. Let's think about it just for a moment. Remember that through the Old Testament, it was those women who were old and barren through whom the greatest miracles came forth. It was those women who were old, barren, and dried up and supposedly beyond the age of giving birth, who by the touch of grace were made possible for them to conceive with their husbands and bear a child who was a special revelation in every case. And those women themselves were a special revelation. That was the pattern throughout the Old Testament. So we can know that the tradition of Joachim and Anna, the barren woman and her elderly husband, having lost all hope of bearing a child and the blessing of children, is again touched by divine grace and bears this child. Mary was born after the flesh according as everyone else was born. There's no such thing as the inheritance of original sin. The concept of original sin never appears anywhere in the ancient church, and I dare say it doesn't appear anywhere in the scripture, even though some people manage to read it into the scripture very often by misreading the original Greek. The doctrine of original sin is a heresy. No one can inherit the guilt of another person. Mary was born in the flesh like all of us. The uh, Immaculate Conception 
I hate to quote uh, one great Greek philosopher and iconographer, Pontius Contagru. When he asked what the orthodox understanding of the Immaculate Conception was, he said it's a poor excuse to a non-existing problem. You see, in the West they thought, well, the Immaculate Conception, uh, when it was finally accepted, was a solution to the doctrine of original sin. How could Mary inherit the guilt of Adam and Eve and still bear Christ? Not a problem because there is no original sin which transmits the guilt of Adam and Eve to anyone else. Consequently, the Immaculate Conception is a fantasy, um, a, a, a false answer to a false problem. But the Virgin was born like as one of us, but of course by a miracle, just as Samuel and Isaac were born of a miracle, and John the Baptist as well. So, in keeping with the, the, the regular pattern of revelation about the coming of redemption, about the nature of the fallen church and the church being renewed. This is a definite fixed pattern throughout the prophecy and revelation of the Old Testament. And here we have the virgin born of a barren old woman and a beautiful icon of Joachim and Anna coming together, embracing each other called the conception of the virgin. It's a uh, really a very touching, warm icon of two people deeply in love with one another who have finally been granted by the grace of God to bear a child. And of course, our children are really are our greatest blessings. So the uh, virgin is born, the one chosen out of all ages and generation. Now is the time for the incarnation of God, for the Christ to be born. And now he prepares his temple. He sets up the ladder from heaven to earth. He calls forth wisdom and understanding. And the Virgin is born into this world, the heavenly ladder by which God came down to earth for our salvation. Come all ye who love virginity and who are the friends of purity. Come all you and welcome with love the boast of virgins. She is a fountain of life who gushes forth from the rock. She is the bush springing from barren ground and burning with the immaterial fire that cleanses and enlightens our souls. Let us just say, it strikes me as, as, as particularly strange that some people would find it difficult to believe that a person would maintain their virginity for the sake of serving God. And in this case, this is precisely what happens. She maintains her virginity. God calls upon her to come into his special service. She becomes the chamber, the chalice, the holy of holies in which God will dwell and come forth into this earth. And so this virginity and purity are beyond the comprehension of so many people, particularly in our modern world. And yet, the fountain of life gushes forth from her, our Lord Jesus Christ. And the bush that burns without being consumed is a type of the virgin also. We read that in Exodus 3, 2, that the virgin is the unburning bush in which God dwells, the fire of divinity dwells without consuming her, without burning her. We'll find that this idea of the fire of divinity is the real explanation of the nature of heaven and hell when we get to that point. What is the sound of festival that we hear? Joachim and Anna mystically keep festival. O oh, Adam and Eve, they cry, rejoice with us today. For if by your transgression you closed the gate of paradise to those of old, we have now been given a glorious through Mary, the child of God, who opens its entrance to us all. The gate of Mary's womb brings forth the God of creation. And where God is present and we are present together with God, we are in paradise. That is paradise for us, to be truly in the presence of God, to have our Lord and the, and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, even in our hearts. So paradise is there in our heart. But the possibility now of returning to paradise 
is manifested through the Virgin by the incarnation of God. On this solemn day of the feast, let us strike the spiritual harp, for today is born the seed of David, the mother of life, who destroys the darkness. She is the restoration of Adam and the recalling of Eve, the fountain of incorruption and the release from corruption. Through her we have been made godlike and delivered from death. Let us, the faithful, cry to her with Gabriel, Rejoice, O full of grace, the Lord is with you, through you granting us great mercy. I think one sometimes has to pause on the word because there's a lot of, of poetic power in them. And you have to pause on exactly what's being said and think really about this. Because did Adam and Eve, did uh, Joachim and Anna really speak face to face with Adam and Eve and say these things? No. This is revealing to us a reality which is taking place. The words are put in the mouth of, of Joachim and Anna. But really, they're speaking to all mankind. Adam and Eve are really the type of the entire human nature. So it's all to the whole of human nature that these things are being spoken. That uh, the being outside of paradise. You know, death was not a punishment of God. And the Holy Fathers tell us it was definitely not a punishment of God. I think only Augustine thought that it was, uh, that God said, if you eat of the fruit, I'll kill you. The Holy Fathers, however, said nothing of the kind. And, uh, but leaving paradise was man's doing, not God's doing. Mankind separated himself from God and therefore was no longer in paradise. The instant man disobeys God, the instant he turns his back on God and tries to hide from him, he can no longer be in paradise. Because paradise is union with God. To be present in the uncreated light and glory of God. And if we read St. John Damascene, we understand that this is what paradise really consists in. I read some very strange theosophical and occult tales about, oh, paradise is a place where uh, fruit would drop from the tree and it wouldn't rot, it would turn it instantly to pure sweet uh, earth. It was... Um, physical carnal place. Paradise can be any place on the face of the earth where one abides in the uncreated light and glory of God. And the earth could provide in superabundance for the needs of mankind. But taking something so materialistically and literal misses the entire point of what paradise really consists in. And it's simply a sort of occult theosophical idea that has no, no merit and no meaning. But that speaking to Adam and Eve, speaking to all of mankind, look, we've fallen away completely from our relationship with God, but now it's possible for us to return to that glorious paradise of dwelling in unity with God and in the eternal light and glory and love which could shine upon us as it did upon our ancestors. And really this very deep and profound saying. But it's put in the mouth of people to say these things. We have to hear it and understand it. And our understanding grows little by little. But our understanding grows through worship. This is one of the things that we should remember. Why was the temple divided into three parts? And why is the Orthodox Church classically divided into three parts? The, the Prefort of the porch, the ship, the nose, or the sanctuary, and the altar. And baptisms and chrismations take place in the prefort. They take place in the in the entrance, the vestibule, and this is where we begin purification through baptism or chrismation. Then we gain illumination, but where? is this illumination gained little by little. In the worshiping community, brothers and sisters, not as an individual, me and God, Christ is my own personal savior, although salvation is personal, yes, but we gain our illumination and we move toward salvation in the community, amongst the brothers and sisters 
in the worshiping community come to worship God and look toward paradise together. <clears throat> and why? Because it's necessary to love one another as I've loved you, as Christ said. It's necessary to have love amongst yourselves. It's necessary to have a community in which we can grow in love and in which we can practice forgiveness and the kind of love that identifies us as truly followers of our Lord Jesus Christ and glorification in that world to come. And that is what the altar of the church is a type of paradise. We open the gates of paradise at the beginning of the liturgy. And the tragedy is that in some how this very unpleasant and unfortunate habit of closing the gates of the liturgy developed so that we could delineate not meaning but the rank of the priest who's serving. It depends solely on the rank of the priest who's serving. Closing the royal gates and the curtain during the liturgy, except perhaps at the priest communion, is a catastrophe. It's a disaster because it robs us of the full meaning of the divine liturgy itself. That the gates of paradise have been opened once more by Christ. Slam! You see, we close them just as Adam and Eve closed the gates of paradise against themselves through sin. This is played out in Vespers, in fact, this whole remembrance. But the gates of paradise are open and there is glorification, purification, illumination, glorification in steps in the church as in the temple of old. And this is uh, what we're called to, to recover paradise. And we recover paradise within the temple, within the, within the framework of communal worship. We're all moving there together. I'm not an isolated iceberg someplace floating across the sea, but we are a community of people, a community of worshiping people in which we're called upon to practice overcoming our divisions, overcoming the things that are against us, overcoming our grudges, overcoming our anger, overcoming our malice, and yielding to our brothers and sisters, rather than creating a, a strife by demanding to have our own way. Yielding to our brothers and sisters in love. This is part of the community, and it is in this that we become illumined. In this practice of love and forgiveness, in this practice of humility before our brothers and sisters, and yielding rather than creating strife in the church, rather than creating division. This is what we're practicing, as well as worshiping together in the temple. Now, we move on to the uh, Matin service a little. At the Troparium of the Feast that we sing, Thy nativity, O Theotokos Virgin, has proclaimed joy to the world. For from you has dawned the Son of Righteousness, Christ our God, annulling the curse and bestowing the blessing, abolishing death, and granting us life everlasting. The joy of the world has shone forth upon us. The, fire, the, the, the renowned virgin sprung from the righteous Joachim and Anna. On account of her exceeding goodness, she has become a living temple of God and is in truth acknowledged as the only Theotokos. Through her prayers, O Christ our God, send down peace upon the world and on our soul's great mercy. Again, the proclamation that a new prophecy has taken place. Elizabeth, in her old age, barren, without child, has conceived and brought forth the forerunner and Baptist, the seal and greatest of all the prophets. For John the Baptist is the seal of the, of the Old Testament prophets and the dawning of the New Testament, the dawning of a new prophecy, the new prophecies of the, Old, of the New Testament. And <clears throat> so it's completely following the normal pattern of revelation from God in the revelation of the church and the Messiah that a virgin shall conceive and bear a child but the prophet tells us behold I'll give you a sign one sign that you'll know that the Messiah has come that a maiden will conceive and bear a child a maiden of course is Unwed, the person is unwed and still virgin. And a maiden will conceive and bear a child. And this is the sign that we've been given. And without that sign, 
the Messiah has not come. That's why in the apse of the church we always have the icon of the Theotokos of the sign. I notice here in North America that some people completely ignorant of the iconographic program and the meaning of the icons don't have the Theotokos in the apse of the church, the Theotokos of the sign. That's a tragedy because that's a revelation to us that the Messiah has truly come. And in the first century catacombs we find precisely that icon of the Theotokos of the sign with Christ in the middle, in the, in the, in the circle of light, and usually the Virgin Orans with her hands outstretched like this. And this is always in the apse of the church. It also figures in to understanding the book of Revelation, which we'll discuss later. And I think probably we'll stop at that point and go on to Matins the next time, because there's much here to think about, and perhaps sometimes uh, people can go back and listen a second time and come to a better understanding by listening a few times to the what these hymns are actually telling us and what they mean. We'll take up the sedalions uh, of, of Matins um, in our next broadcast. So thank you for joining us and eventually this this will be all this will be published as a book and also will be on um, on my blog site that uh, ladikasblog.com. So thank you for joining us and uh, please keep us in your prayers. And if anybody can identify this beautiful rose pink stone, you can maybe send me an email and tell me what it is. I can't identify it myself. It's a beautiful piece of crystal, and uh, I'm not sure what it is. Thank you all, and God bless you, and keep us all in your prayers. And special prayers for Father Roman Braga, uh, one of the few genuine elders and spiritual fathers that we have in North America, and uh, is very ill right now. So we ask for special prayers from Father Roman Braga.